So good morning, everyone. On behalf of BICL, the School of International Arbitration at Queen Mary University of London and Babcock University, I'm delighted to open the second day of the inaugural African Arbitration Day. As the title of the event suggests, this is only the first of a series of Africa Arbitration Days which we aim to organize in the years to come. And as a director of the School of International Arbitration at Queen Mary, I'm particularly pleased that we are part of this long-term project because we believe that engagement with such an exciting and full of new opportunities, ideas, and talent content like Africa must be ongoing and meaningful. Our aim is not simply to bring together speakers for one-off event, but to use this annual series as a platform to explore long-term research and professional opportunities with Africa, and indeed be able to offer any capacity building facilities we can possibly offer in the years to come. From my personal experience, both at the university and my arbitration practice, I often meet with young students and arbitration practitioners from Africa, and I know personally how bright, well-read, and eager to develop a career in international arbitration they are. And I consider it to be my duty, indeed, all our duty, in the spirit of the principle of inclusiveness, to offer these people, these students, the right opportunities to achieve their noble ambitions. I want again to thank our sponsors, Freshfields and Leaklaters. While we're conscious that in the current challenging environment, it is difficult for law firms to commit to any financial sponsorship, it is equally important that academic conferences and events like that continue to take place and their generous sponsorship offers a great assistance. Indeed, in the current circumstances where traveling is widely restricted, it is even more necessary that we continue to gather from different places of the world, even if virtually, and talk and exchange views, ideas, and perspectives for arbitration. International arbitration is not only the most vibrant and exciting field of international law currently, in my view, it is also one of the most flexible and innovative ones, which has managed to adapt very quickly and efficiently in the new circumstances and continues right now its business as usual by electronic and virtual means. This is international arbitration at its best and the gathering today of so many speakers and participants from all over the world underscores this observation. We have a very interesting second day today with a greatly distinguished group of speakers who will today focus on Africa as a potential seat of arbitration and also on the support that African courts can provide to arbitration, both during the course of arbitration proceedings, but also at the time of enforcement of arbitral awards. And without further ado, I would like to leave the floor to my good friend and colleague, Charles Nyack of White and Case, who is also the president of the Lagos Arbitration Courts, to which I have the honor of being a member. Charles has the pleasure to chair the keynote address of Honorable Mr. Justice Mike Chipita, Justice of the Supreme Court of Uganda, Kampala. Charles, the floor is yours. Stavros. I just want to check that everyone can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes, I see a yes in the chat session. Thank you very much, Stavros, for your uh, a very kind introduction. And it is uh, my pleasure, uh, in turn, to introduce the Honourable Mr. Justice Michael Chibita. Uh, a few words <coughs> to introduce Mr. Chibita. He studied law undergraduate and postgraduate in Uganda, and then obtained a Master of International and Comparative Law from the University of Iowa, where he also taught. 
He returned to Uganda in 1994 as a state attorney in the Attorney General's uh, chambers. Uh, from 1996 to 2003, he served as private secretary to legal affairs to the president of Uganda. After that, he returned to the Attorney General's chambers and then served as assistant commissioner within the Uganda Revenue Authority. In 2005, he became a judge sitting on the High Court of uh, Uganda. And after doing that for three years, he became the director of public prosecutions, the DPP uh, for Uganda. Uh, his achievements as a DPP have drawn attention among others, and I'm sure I'm gonna miss some points here, but the ones that have been brought to my attention is that he's created new offices uh, uh, throughout the country. He introduced strategies to reduce the backlog of cases and the strategies uh, delivered superb results. And I was also impressed by his introduction of an online case management system. And I guess uh, no good deeds uh, go unpunished. And uh, after serving so successfully as DPP, uh, uh, Mr. Justice Michael Chibita was appointed to the Supreme Court of Uganda in December last year. Now, I, I could say more, but I will stop there. The, the point I want to make in this introduction is that we are going to hear from a leading lawyer with remarkable experience and achievements, not only in the judiciary, but also in government functions generally and policy making in particular. We're gonna hear from someone who has proven that he is a mover and a shaker, as the expression goes. And I therefore really look forward to hearing his thoughts on the topic that he's chosen to address today, namely the comp complementarity of arbitration and the judicial system and the tension between arbitration and litigation in Africa. Now, in the exchanges I've had with uh, Mr. Justice Michael Chibita, I've been struck by how down to earth and uh, humble he's remained despite all his achievements. And that is exemplified by uh, his email signature block, which simply says, Justice Mike. I must say, I, that's a touch that I uh, really like. I was very impressed by that. So if I may say so, Justice Mike, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Charles, for that uh, moving introduction. Uh, you did not ask me for my CV, so I wonder where you are getting all that information from. <laughs> but uh, glad to be here, and uh, thanks to Dr. Bankole, who introduced me to this uh, forum. And uh, all of you are distinguished participants. It gives me great pleasure, really, to be here. And interestingly, the places I've been to, the Attorney General Chambers, where I was in the, the Directorate of uh, Civil Affairs, and later in the Directorate of Civil Litigation, some of the things we were dealing with were clearing contracts and dealing with uh, arbitration issues. And one of the issues we always were told about is all these international agreements. It is standard that you include a clause for arbitration. And then uh, I went to Uganda Revenue Authority and uh, interestingly, there's a case I'm going to highlight, which uh, was a litigation between Uganda Revenue Authority and uh, Heritage Oil. And I will start with that. As uh, some of you may be aware, Uganda discovered oil a few years ago and uh, it's not yet out of the ground. And so I think the original explorer of the oil was Heritage Oil. But after they have done all the groundwork, they uh, sold to Talo Oil. And I understand these are common practices uh, at this stage. So when they sold to Talo Oil, uh, Uganda Revenue Authority, I had left then, so I, I don't take any responsibility or credit for what happened. But uh, uh, Uganda Revenue Authority sent a tax note 
to Heritage Oil and said you have sold to Talo and uh, capital gains tax applies, so we need you to pay uh, the following amount of money. And Heritage raised some objections, blah, blah. It went to the tax appeals tribunal here, and eventually it ended up for arbitration in London. And uh, contrary to what most people had expected, most observers, the arbitration actually went in favor of uh, Uganda and Uganda Revenue Authority. And uh, URA was awarded uh, $400 million from that transaction. Why do I say contrary to the expectations of uh, many people? There's a commonly held view that uh, international arbitration is mostly tilted against the interests of Africa. And as evidence of this, many people point to the fact that almost all arbitration involving African countries and uh, multinational comp companies takes place in uh, Western capitals. And you know, there's something about the venue for, for a meeting or for arbitration or for litigation. Everybody wants to, to have the venue which is uh, convenient to them. So th this is always an issue. Why is the arbitration always in London, in Paris, in Washington? Why never in uh, Ouagadougou, for example? And of course, they also point out that uh, it is always presided over by Western-based arbitrators. None of the arbitrators, if, if any, except maybe a few times, are uh, Western-based or Westerners. And also that uh, most of the lawyers involved in this arbitration are from Western-based law firms. And of course, there must be explanations for this, especially the issue of arbitrators and uh, lawyers. You cannot have uh, people arbitrating who don't have the, the skill, the experience, the qualifications. And you cannot have people arguing before the arbitrators who do not have the knowledge and the experience. So it goes to the fundamental question is why is Africa so much behind in these areas? Why are there no arbitrators and uh, lawyers who can do arbitration from Africa? These are questions that uh, I've been picking up from my time as uh, at the Attorney General's Chambers, my time at Revenue Authority, and my uh, interaction. So, so there's always a belief, and unfortunately it's borne out by uh, a number of cases. I don't have statistics for this, that uh, most of the cases that go to arbitration between African countries or companies and uh, multinational companies, usually the outcome is not favorable for Africa. And it may not be that, uh, th that the arbitrators are biased. It, it may just be that uh, the level of preparation or knowledge of the field. You know, it is like uh, football. I'm uh, a fan of uh, the greatest football club in England, Arsenal. And I know that if you are not well prepared as a team, regardless of where you come from, if you come across a well prepared team, they will uh, wallop you. So it may not be a question of bias. I don't think it is. It is a question of preparation. And so one of the things we need to talk about is how do we equip Africans and African countries, African lawyers and uh, Africans who want to enter into this field to be able to represent the African continent, the African governments, African revenue authorities uh, much better. Of course, time cannot allow us to delve further into this issue of uh, international arbitration. But I just wanted to point out that uh, definitely this is uh, one of the cases which turned out very well for, for Uganda, for Uganda Revenue Authority and for Africa. And uh, some people credit this to the fact that URA had a solid case, but also that uh, they were able to hire some of the best in this field. However, let me now go to the issue of uh, of uh, the local arbitration. And I'll start by saying in recent years, the legal profession has become increasingly enchanted with non-judicial dispute, dispute resolution mechanisms. 
and arbitration there, therefore is one of them. And many countries have gone further by enacting enabling laws to provide the legal basis for arbitration. Uganda has set up arbitration centers like the Center for Arbitration to breathe life into enacted laws. And arbitration definitely has various strengths which give it the capability to complement the judicial system in adjudication and dispute settlement. However, from the outset, we need to note that arbitration has faced grave criticism. And I uh, here point to Professor Owen Fiss, whom Wikipedia refers to as Sterling Professor Emeritus at the Yale University School of Law. His criticism of ADR, arbitration inclusive, seems to rest on three grounds. One, his perception of potential conflicts between the public and private interests in the private resolution of disputes. Two, his apparent belief in the ability of courts to render more or better justice than can be obtained through private dispute resolution mechanisms such as arbitration. And three, his view that adjudication has broader purposes than the achievement of peace between the disputing parties. Just as a working definition, arbitration has been defined as a process by which a dispute or difference between two or more parties as to their mutual legal rights and liabilities is referred to and determined judicially with binding effect by the application of law by one or more persons referred to as arbitrators or arbitral tribunal instead of by a court of law. And I think here the emphasis should be on instead of. In Uganda, arbitration was officially embraced when the Arbitration and Conciliation Act 2000, herein we will refer to it as the Act. So it was passed and commenced in the year 2000, that's uh, about 20 years ago. And this Act deals with domestic arbitration, international commercial arbitration, and the enforcement of foreign arbitral awards, among others. In achieving its purpose, the Act gives independence to the institution of arbitration by limiting interference by the judiciary to the extent that there has been compliance with the Act. And we have had some case law to buttress this position. In the case of power and city contract, versus LTL project, a case of 2011. Justice Stephen Mubiru, a high court judge here in Uganda, cited with approval the case of National Social Security versus Alcon International, a case of 2008. And in that case, it was held, and I quote, an arbitration clause in a contract has an enduring and special effect, that is, even if the parties decide to adopt a different dispute resolution mechanism for a particular dispute that arises under a contract, the arbitration continues in force and is not thereby totally repudiated unless there is solid reason for doing so. Courts will always refer a dispute to arbitration where there is an arbitration clause in a contract, close quotation. So he then referred the case to arbitration and awarded costs. Now, this is instructive, of course, the ruling itself. It is a good sign for arbitration that, uh, you know, the judicial process can, uh, can defer to the arbitration. But of course, the condition here is that uh, there must have been an arbitration clause. And two, that uh, one of the parties raises the issue that uh, this matter must have gone to arbitration first. The level of adoption of arbitration has gone as far as barring a party who chooses arbitration as the first method of dispute resolution from other remedies. And uh, this principle was exercised by the Center for Dispute Resolution Kampala in the case of Uganda Post Limited 
against East Africa General Insurance Company Limited, and uh, these cases have citations, and I will be willing to share the paper after so that people can access the cases. The tribunal held that uh, parties to alternative dispute resolution clauses under a, uh, under a mutual obligation to fulfill the clause by active participation, failing which they unwittingly forfeit their statutory rights. However, the judiciary is at liberty to set aside an arbitral award for reasons like incapacity of parties to enter into an arbitration agreement, invalid arbitration agreement, and lack of notice of appointment of an arbitrator, among other reasons. And this is set out in section 34 of the Act. The power of the judiciary to set aside arbitral awards helps diagnose weaknesses that may have attracted criticism. For example, the conflict between private and public interest can be addressed when a court of law hears and evaluates evidence relating to the incapacity of parties or the invalidity of the arbitration agreement. In doing so, it can be argued that the court is impliedly balancing the private and the public interests. And yet, therein lies the tension between arbitration and litigation. It would seem that the judiciary always has upper hand in as far as it can overturn arbitration awards or come in to act as the umpire. Uganda's legal regime allows arbitration proceedings to go on side by side with judicial proceedings. This on the face of it fosters division of work since matters referable to arbitration are severed from other disputes occasioned by the same fact. And this has been uh, well ex uh, expressed by uh, the then head of the Center for Distribute Resolution, Mr. Jimmy Mianja, in the case of Usafi Market Vendors Association against Safinet Uganda Limited. He had the following to say in that case. I have sound belief that the High Court, conscious of the ever-increasing backlog, may not be pleased to pre preside over issues which may very well be handled by the arbitrator." Close quotation. Such division of work lessens the case burden on the judiciary, hence dealing with the issue of case backlog. The biggest critique against arbitration is that arbitration lacks the weight of accept acceptance and force that the courts of law have. I will say that again about the biggest critique against arbitration, is that arbitration lacks the weight of acceptance and the force that the courts of law have. That the public obeys the judgment of a judicial officer cannot be overemphasized. For arbitral awards, precedents uh, abound about where they have been challenged, where they cannot be enforced. And at the end of my presentation, I will take off five minutes to tell you about uh, a case where I worked as an, uh, an arbitrator and uh, the award has never been uh, implemented. But because of the fact that arbitration lacks the weight of acceptance and force that the courts of law have, the purpose of arbitration, one can say, is uh, defeated by lack of proper enforceability. As a result, most parties are more likely to choose the judiciary route rather than arbitration. Yet, it can be strongly argued that arbitration as a form of dispute resolution is closer to indigenous African ways of dispute resolution. This is more so since the procedure arbitration adopts is closely uh, linked to African customary law, especially as compared to court proceedings. In considering whether arbitration existed in African customary law in relation to Kenya, and I quote Nguyo Wachira Patrick, in arbitration in Kenya, facilitating access to justice by identifying 
and reducing challenges affecting arbitration. Publication of the University of Nairobi 2015. Anguyo says, in considering whether arbitration existed in African customary law in relation to Kenya, the operative words are consensual and agreed to present their disputes to a third party. I must say Kenya and Uganda customarily are very, very similar. So what he's saying about Kenya definitely would apply to Uganda and I bet would apply to many African countries. Although Nguyo argues that since in African customary law, the parties did not have a say in picking their arbitrator, that system of dispute settlement was akin to court proceedings. The only addition I had to this was that uh, in many of the instances, especially in land disputes, marriage disputes, customarily the arbitrators are always known. They are always either the clan heads or the chiefs. And so it is not even a choice. The people already know that uh, the arbitrator in this case is known. So you, you find that because of that issue of uh, the clan head sitting and arbitrating the matter and trying to work out a win-win situation, you find that uh, you would say arbitration is closer to the African way of resolving the conflict. Although arbitration has its limitations as a means of ADR, the symbiotic relationship between the two systems reflected in the Arbitration Act leaves room for complementarity and helps improve the dispensation of justice with each system reinforcing each other. In my view, therefore, unless the, uh, and until arbitral awards are given the same weight as court awards, arbitration will continue to play second fiddle to litigation through courts of law. But again, this may not be a problem because we have to look at arbitration. Are we putting it in competition with the judicial process or are we saying it is uh, supplementary and therefore courts of law can take precedence, can take the lion's share of matters and arbitration can come in as a close second. And I think that is uh, one of the things we have to, you know, to contend with and, uh, and uh, reconcile ourselves to. Are we looking at arbitration as being in competition with uh, litigation, with courts of law processes? Or are we saying, I think our primary mode of uh, conflict resolution is uh, through litigation, through courts of law and arbitration and other alternative dispute resolution mechanisms can come in supplement, can play a second fiddle or whatever fiddle, and uh, that is no problem. So I, I think that issue has to be resolved at least in our minds, in our discussion, before we, we, we talk about whether we need to bring uh, arbitration at the same level as uh, court or not. Allow me to share a personal experience in arbitrating a matter between parties involving a tier state. And, and this happened in 2007 when uh, I was a legal officer to the president. This matter involved a tier state. And uh, some of you know that uh, in 1973, our then president, Idi Amin, expelled Ugandans of Asian origin we have a sizable Asian community here, especially in the business world. And they came here long ago. Many of them are citizens. They were brought in by the British to build the Uganda Railway, Uganda Kenya Railway, which was. So many of them, <laughs> their grandfathers were born here. But Idi Amin, in any case, uh, in 1973, decided to expel most of them. So they had to leave their businesses behind. And one of those businesses was this tea estate. <clears throat> and of course, when they were expelled, then uh, Amin either gave 
those businesses to his uh, his uh, his allies, or what was not given out was taken over by uh, some local people. In any case, uh, when the Obote government came to power in 1980, one of the things they had to do was to return properties to the Asians who had been expelled. And uh, they did so. But of course, this created a tension between the people who had been given <laughs> by the government, uh, given uh, by whatever means, and acquired some kind of right. So we have had to deal with those kinds of cases. Asian original owners of the property and uh, the people who had been given by the regime. This was one such a case. And the parties decided that uh, I, I see it in arbitration. They wrote to me, and uh, indeed I arbitrated and did uh, an award. And they all signed. Uh, so I, I, I thought this is uh, really straight, straightforward, and the award was going to be implemented. It involved parties exchanging cash, compensation, and, and that kind of thing. But up to today, the award has not been uh, implemented. Uh, there have been about five <laughs> lawsuits arising uh, from that award. And uh, even recently, uh, as a judge here at the Supreme Court, I've uh, been asked to, to explain under what circumstances I became an arbitrator in that matter. Uh, of course, it doesn't help matters that uh, two of the parties who signed uh, have since passed on. So the successors in title, uh, either feeling that uh, they could have got a better deal or they can get a better deal through courts of law, have now decided to appeal against it and wanting to set it aside. Uh, and so th this was uh, a kind of informal arbitration. It, uh, it was not done under the, under the act strictly. But it is where the party said, hey, we want an arbitrator, and uh, please come and be our arbitrator. And they all shook hands and all. But uh, years down the road, uh, this arbitration award definitely has uh, fallen into trouble. So this is an example of uh, what happens with uh, arbitration awards. It seems there is no clear path through which uh, they can be enforced. And of course, the route to litigation, back to litigation, back to courts of law, is always wide open, which is uh, not necessarily a bad thing. My view is that uh, once this door is open, is left open, <laughs> I think people will use it. People will go through it because there are always people who think they can get a better deal somewhere else and, and all that. And in the, in the final analysis, I would like to say that uh, I'm glad that uh, this discussion, this conversation has started, or maybe I've gotten involved in it at this point. And as I mentioned, through my uh, different paths in my career, through the Attorney General, and through the Uganda Revenue Authority and in the office of the president at State House, and now a judge, I've come across a lot of times when uh, arbitration has been used, could have been used. And uh, I think I'm a supporter of alternative dispute resolution. And therefore, I would definitely embrace arbitration over litigation. In the Office of the Director of Public Prosecution, the, 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 the alternative system we have there is called plea bargaining, which uh, Uganda embraced from the United States of America about five years ago between uh, Office of the Director of Public Prosecution and, uh, and uh, the judiciary. We decided that uh, it was cheaper, it was uh, faster, and uh, the parties were entitled to a win-win situation, as opposed to a winner takes all in the case of uh, prosecution. So conversely, I think arbitration should be a much more preferred 
uh, system of dispute resolution. From my considered view as uh, somebody who litigated cases in civil litigation, uh, somebody who received complaints from litigants uh, in the office of the president, uh, somebody who handled matters as a judge and now I'm handling at uh, the Supreme Court. I know that uh, alternative dispute resolution, arbitration for that matter, is cheaper, should be faster, and I think leaves the parties more satisfied than uh, if we went through litigation. I beg to end here and thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Justice Mike, for these uh, insights. And uh, I invite members of the audience to come up with any questions they might have. They can insert the question, type it into the chat box, or just uh, uh, step in uh, or signal to the moderator that they wish to ask a question. I think I might use my privilege as the chair of this session to ask the first uh, uh, question, uh, Justice Mike. And uh, my question is the following. In my experience, in most jurisdictions, there is a tension between uh, judges and, and arbitration, namely, uh, judges do consider quite rightly that they have a form of natural monopoly over justice and see arbitration as a threat to that natural uh, monopoly. And, and to be clear, uh, the main jurisdiction I have in mind in making that comment is actually the jurisdiction where I'm based in, in France, which is of course well known as a very arbitration friendly jurisdiction. Yet I have a number of uh, friends who are judges and they always ask me these strange questions, you know, oh, arbitration, that's like, that's the sort of rough, uh, rough and tumble justice, right? Someone just flips a coin and that's how they resolve the disputes. And I tell them, no, it's actually a very elaborate, detailed system of justice where the arbitrators listen to a lot of uh, evidence and pleadings and witnesses and will usually draft very lengthy awards, etc. And they're, they're surprised by what they hear. But the, that natural tendency of these, uh, uh, of these judges, in, in good faith, of course, to have this rejection of arbitration is the reason why in France, for example, there is a specific chamber that deals with uh, recognition and annulment of, uh, of awards, simply because it's considered that those matters cannot be left to any, uh, any judge, however competent they are. It has to be given to judges who have a deep understanding of, uh, of arbitration. So that was just by way of illustration that my question is not targeting any jurisdiction in particular, but generally there is this natural tendency on the part of judges to, to do, to, to not to, to welcome arbitration. What is your experience in that regard in, uh, in Uganda, uh, Justice Mike? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Charles. Uh, as you were talking, I was trying to see what could have been, what could be the source of the tension and uh, maybe the judges feeling uh, more entitled. And I was asking myself that uh, could it go to the fact that uh, who pays the arbitrators as opposed to who pays the judges? In, uh, in, in, in many instances, I think the arbitrators are paid by the parties whereas judges are paid by, uh, by the government, by the taxpayer. So, uh, I mean, the, the, the mere fact that uh, arbitrator is paid by parties and, and also is appointed by the parties in many instances, as opposed to judges who are appointed by the government again through a rigorous system, uh, I think that, that could be one of the answers on why the judges may feel they are more qualified, more entitled, superior, and, and, and having that complex Be because they have a system that is set up in the government and uh, there's, uh, you know, extensive legal framework. For example, in Uganda and I guess in many other countries, the judiciary is uh, the third arm of government. You have the executive, the legislature, and uh, the judiciary is the whole arm of government. So 
in order to lend support to the arbitrators, they either have to, to be made to be at par with the arbitrators or find a way of uh, setting up a legal framework that will, uh, will be seen to bring them up to the level uh, of, of judges. And I think you asked about what is my experience. I, I think that is also the experience here in Uganda and the cases I've uh, heard about. Uh, it's like arbitrators are paid by the parties, rightly or wrongly, there's a belief that uh, they can be easily influenced. Of course, I know that uh, there's a belief like that about judges, but uh, more so about arbitrators. And then you find that uh, most arbitrations, uh, cases involving uh, multinational companies, companies with a lot of money. So that in itself raises the issue that can a multinational company really lose a case and uh, will it not be able to own the arbitrator and, and that kind of thing. I think those are some of the issues that come into play here. But my, my recommendation would be arbitration should be raised to, to the same level or nearly as the same level, but gradually with a, with a, with a judicial system. Courts of law, yeah. Thank you very much. There's a question from Professor uh, Bancoli Sulipo. Uh, Bancoli, over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Judge uh, Chibita. My question, you cited a Ugandan arbitration uh, matter, which was an award that was uh, in London, and it appears it involved tax. Uh, in Nigeria, a court of appeal recently held, uh, at least in two cases, that taxation is not arbitrable. So if, <laughs> if the dispute uh, has to do with tax, Mm. Um, it won't be arbitrable. Now, I'd like to know whether the Ugandan arbitration dealt only with the question whether the transaction was taxable or whether it went on to also deal with the amount of the tax and the process of, of tax. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sudipo. Uh, so what happened is uh, when there is a tax matter, according to our tax law here in Uganda, the matter must first go to the Tax Appeals Tribunal. And the Tax Appeals Tribunal is, uh, is, is a tribunal made up of uh, non-judges. They are professionals in different areas, uh, law, finance, and taxation. And they sit and can determine the matter. Then <clears throat> their decision is appealable to the High Court. But uh, all matters must. So this particular matter also started with the Tax Appeals Tribunal. But uh, then uh, the, I think under the agreement between, uh, so, so the issue was first between uh, Heritage Oil and Taro Oil, uh, the, two, the two companies, one which had sold to the other. And I think in their agreement, they had said uh, the matter would be taken to arbitration. So when Uganda Revenue Authority uh, asked for the tax, I think they used the, the, their own agreement between the two companies to say the issues resolving around uh, this sale were subject to arbitration. And therefore, when, when uh, URA came in, one of the parties said, but uh, you cannot because this matter is a private matter between us companies. And, and that's when you are said, but uh, it involves tax. So the issues had to do with the, the, the right to tax. And then too, it also dealt with the amount of tax. So th there was the issue first, of, first and foremost on whether this, uh, this capital gains attracted the tax and then to the issue of what amount would be taxable. And uh, uh, we don't have such a ruling yet in our courts uh, to declare that uh, taxation isn't arbitrable. I hope I've answered your question, Professor. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm informed that there's uh, the next question is from uh, Bamikole Adoloji. Bamikole. Um, 
Yes, um, thank you very much. I'm Bamikole Adulujo, a doctoral researcher from Robert Gordon University in the United Kingdom. Uh, my question is, uh, in Nigeria, where I'm very familiar with the Nigerian jurisdiction and I practice there. In Nigeria, the, in 2017, the Chief Justice of uh, Nigeria issued a practice direction, more like a policy document, to hold the subordinate courts, that's Court of Appeal, Federal High Court, and all Court of First Instances in Nigeria, to ensure that they enforce arbitration clause. Whenever they find any sign of arbitration or parties ready to go to arbitration or one of the parties ready to go to arbitration, arbitration must be encouraged. And this particular document has been really yielding a good result in Nigeria because most judges are, are aware of this duty to um, enforce arbitration um, agreement first. I want to know if there's any corresponding such um, documents in Uganda jurisdiction and if not, is um, the Supreme Court of Uganda considering having such a policy document? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ad Adulogio, for that question. One, in Uganda, uh, those practice directions are issued by the Chief Justice, of course, after having done uh, enough consultation with the stakeholders. So it would not be the Supreme Court to issue, it would be the Chief Justice. Of course, the Chief Justice is the head of the judiciary, but is also the head of the Supreme Court. Mm, secondly, no, we, we, we don't have such a, such a, a practice direction yet, but uh, we have precedent from the High Court, which has not been challenged, that uh, once there's an arbitration clause in an agreement, parties should not run to court. And if they run to court, the judge is at liberty and should send them back to arbitration before. So, uh, in fact, you could say that uh, the Ugandan position is, uh, is stronger because it, is, uh, it has the, the force of law. Uh, if you, uh, as you know, precedent, and it is a high court decision, it has not been uh, set aside. So it is as good as law that uh, once there is an arbitration clause in an agreement, it must first go to arbitration before it comes to, to the courts of law. I, I needed to ask uh, Dr. Bankole if the Court of Appeal is the highest court in Nigeria, or if this decision was appealed, the one saying taxation isn't arbitrable for the um, sake no, of we the do have, uh, We do have a Supreme Court in Nigeria, um, okay. but there are two different cases by um, 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 I think ESO and also by Shell, okay. and uh, the, the Court of Appeal have given such a decision. Um, so we are waiting what the Supreme Court will say. Okay, okay, thank you. And it has also affected the enforcement of some awards in the states. Uh, those decisions. Sure, sure. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, the next question comes from I don't have the full name, but I see it on the screen. It's uh, Ebay, uh, Ebay, over to you, please. Perhaps he needs to unmute. Hello, Ebay, we can't hear you. Ebay, you, pro you might be on mute. Hello? Ebay, we cannot hear you. Hello? Well, let me, while we're waiting for eBay to resolve this technical issue, let me maybe uh, ask one follow-up question I had for Justice Mike, and it's, it's, it's the following. I, I've noticed with uh, great interest your comments about arbitration playing second fiddle to the court system and, and uh, your interest in promoting arbitration so that they are given, I think you mentioned in your speech that they could be given the same weight as court awards, and that's a very thought-provoking uh, comment, which I'm still still digesting. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Now, in a context, and I'm looking at the context today, where, of course, and I'm not familiar with the system in Uganda, but there is a statute, I'm sure, governing the recognition of awards in, uh, in Uganda so that they can be enforced using the power, the public power through the courts and uh, et cetera. So on the one hand, 
in order for uh, an award to be actually enforced, if that is necessary, it needs to somehow be recognized in the jurisdiction where it will be enforced. And on the other hand, of course, typically the, 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 the grounds for refusing to recognize the award or for annulling the award are fairly, uh, fairly limited. So that's the legal framework today. Uh, do you have any practical ideas as to what could be done in order to promote arbitration uh, and further? Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Charles. And uh, as you are asking that, I was thinking that uh, the awards, arbitration awards, in a way have to go through the court system to be enforced. And you know, that is, uh, that, that is uh, a tricky route because somebody who is opposed to will now use that very procedure to block it and to raise objections and to delay it. So there almost has to be a self-enforcing procedure where the awards don't have to go through courts of law because by going through courts of law, you are almost tempting the person against whom the award has been made <laughs> To, to trip to trip the, the award. You know, execution is a, is a very uh, dicey issue. So in the High Court here, they had instituted uh, a department of uh, execution and beliefs so that if the civil court has passed a judgment, for that judgment to be enforced, it had to go through another division of the High Court called the Execution Division. And this caused a lot of confusion for the five years this uh, division was in place. And uh, just last month, they had to scrap that division because it seemed like reopening litigation. Somebody had to prove A, B, C, and D, and uh, then the person against whom they the, the, the enforcement was would bring up all kinds of roadblocks. And I see this the same way with the arbitral award. As long as you allow it to go through through a court system, another process, I, I think you are tempting the person against whom the award has been made to, to, to really raise all kinds of objections. So there has to be a way of the award being self-enforcing. Very, very good. Now, in the interim, the question from eBay has come through on the on the chat box, and I, I will read that out uh, to you. Just I can to... also speak if you want. Oh. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, eBay. Uh, over to you. Over to okay. You. Thank you, Justice Chivita. I am eBay from the University of York, a doctoral student. Uh, I was going to ask about equality of arms in prosecutions. The the state tends to take the place of the victims. Uh, so as to bring about some sort of equality of arms between the victims and the, the defense. I wonder how uh, there can be equality of negotiating powers uh, between, the, uh, between those who come before arbitration. And secondly, you, were, you referred to your experience of arbitrating the case involving the Ugandans of uh, Asian descent whose properties were seized by Amin. I'm wondering whether you think that arbitration can work in the case involving some white farmers in Zimbabwe whose lands were taken by the Mugabe regime. Uh, thank you very much. I, I think arbitration can work in any case, and especially in land matters. Because land matters, usually you have two parties and uh, both of them are interested in, uh, in, 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 in the lands. And uh, thankfully, it usually involves huge chunks of land. I'll give you an example. I, uh, when I was a high court judge, I met a friend of mine who had filed a land case. It was 25 acres, and he had the land title, but there were the people who we call uh, bona fide occupants who had lived on the land. And uh, next time I met him, he said, we pulled the case from your court, and we agreed to settle. I said, how did you settle? He said, uh, I agreed to give the settlers, the bona fide occupants, 
five acres and I would issue them land titles and all, and I keep the 20. So they got an arbitrator and uh, that is, and, and both of them were happy. He lost five acres, but you could say he gained 20 acres. So the, the case you are talking about Zimbabwe and, and so on, I think wherever there is a land, people just want land. So an, an arbitrator just needs to come in and say, can you take this and you take this? It's a question of how do you share it? I think land presents the best case scenario for arbitration to work because you need a win-win situation. Everybody needs uh, to have a piece of the land and to live peacefully on that land because if there is no peaceable arrangement, conclusion to the matter, then there will always be trouble, attacks from the part which has lost and, and, and so on. And uh, you, you raise the issue of prosecution where the victims really, the, the DPP and the prosecutors are the lawyers for the victims. Arbitration is, uh, is, is a bit different because uh, <laughs> uh, if I could use the case of Uganda Revenue Authority against Heritage Oil, uh, who is the victim? Uh, it, it will be difficult uh, to come up with a victim and each of these parties have their own lawyers and uh, they think they have their own rights. So, uh, and so most of the cases that come to arbitration are civil matters. And civil matters the issue of victim does not, is not as clear as it is in, in the criminal law. Criminal law, the victim is always very, very clear. In civil matters, it will be difficult. But if you identify the case where there was a, one party being a victim, I think, yeah, there is a case for, for government coming up with, uh, with uh, lawyers, uh, victims' lawyers. I, I definitely would agree because uh, having been a DPP, I know that... Uh, victims really look look to the dpp to to you know to promote their case and without the dpp especially if they are indigent they are poor they, then uh, they are left to the to the to the masses of the law and to the perpetrators of the crime so yeah if an, a victim can be identified in a case of arbitration definitely i would support the idea of uh, having vic victim counsel in one form or another thank you Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Mike. That is uh, very interesting. We're now unfortunately past the end time of our session. Unsurprisingly, uh, there are questions in the pipeline, but unfortunately, we're simply not able to address them. Uh, I say unsurprisingly because your thought-provoking speech, I think, uh, undoubtedly was bound to uh, uh, generate a number of the questions and this discussion could go on for, for a long time. I just want to thank you very much uh, for participating in, uh, in this conference and this session today. Thank you also to all the participants who asked uh, very interesting questions. And uh, I think we now have a 10 minute break before we move on to the next session. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much for chairing and uh, enjoy the break. <laughs>